Welcome. This is a July 3rd Open ZFS production user call. We have Greg, Jan, Yasanti, and myself, Michael. And I have an open question now that BSD CAN is out of the way. Is there anyone who wants to help with the upcoming in October, very late October, user and developer summit? You can either chime in now or mail me or otherwise. Sure. Could you, uh, what, what would that entail, more or less? Uh, Yes, it would entail something, and uh, that remains to be determined insofar as there's, at this very moment, me reaching out to uh, potential sponsors and working on some networking at the venue. Uh, what part of the world are you in, Santi, if I may? Uh, the the soon-to-be-freest part of the world. Tomorrow's July 4th. No, I'm in, uh, I'm in Boston. <laughs> Boston, got it. Um, so I, the, uh, for what it's worth, Stu is in the Portland area, which is great. So is Rob. Ah. So we do have some boots on the ground, but if it's also something you might be interested in attending, uh, let's just sort of get that conversation going. Are you receiving the announcements? If so, I can simply start mailing folks like yourself. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm signed up to, okay. to that one. But drop to your mail. Email. No, to this specific, to this call. Uh, drop your mail in chat to be safe, and we'll go from there. Cool. Thank you. So, also, Santi, you had some follow-up questions about OpenZFS drive encryption options. Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned uh, you know, a while back, um, most of the time I was using ZFS in, in production, you know, properly. Um, was about 10 years ago now. Huh. Um, and I remember that back then, you know, uh, encryption was a, a, a little weird. It might've just been how we were doing it, but um, there were some pitfalls um, and I just wanted to, I don't know, um, I guess open the floor for discussion around like uh, things, to, common things to look out for, you know, assumptions not to, uh, that you probably shouldn't make if you're coming from a, I don't know, Linux, like Luke's, background or similar. Right. So what OS did you use 10 years ago? Uh, it was a Ubuntu. It was a grafted on Ubuntu 1204 with uh, open CFS. Okay, cool. So uh, just the super basics. Uh, now, obviously, there's open CFS native encryption, and that's an ongoing topic and is, of course, exciting, but there are some rough edges and pitfalls and you name it. In the good old days, there was Lux on Linux, Loops, and uh, Gelly on FreeBSD, which is simply a layer of encryption with its various opportunities and challenges and the fact that they're OS specific. And then finally, there are self-encrypting drives, which make everything transparent to the user. And according to some, just about every drive today is self-encrypting and they just enable or disable a feature to expose it to the user. So from an administrative perspective, that kicks it off to things like said util, I believe, which lets you manage that. And you may have to put in almost like, like a BIOS level password early before everything or boot to something and then uh, bring on your data pool. So looking forward, which one of those feels the most right to you? Well, I mean, this is a largely hypothetical. Uh <laughs> Operationally, I prefer to put a block level encryption on the partitions underneath ZFS. The downside of that is, uh, especially for writing to mirrored pools, that you uh, amplify the uh, crypto throughput you need. Uh, but with modern CPUs with hardware encryption, this tends not to be a big issue. Um, at least the systems where you want encryption and you don't really have big enough CPUs. But if you need those, yeah, okay, you're a bit out of luck. Um, and you could use self-encrypting drives, but I just lack the confidence in the quality of the encryption. It's really a hit or miss, 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 miss again uh, when it comes to the quality of self-encrypting drives. Uh, but, okay, that's an option. Um, self-encrypting drives have the advantage that they're underneath the operating system, so they're in theory uh, 
cross operating system, whereas hardware assisted software encryption is at the block level is normally operating system specific. So if you use a FreeBSD way of doing block level encryption, you can't read the encrypted disks on Linux and the other way around. That can be a major problem if you need it. Uh, but I happen not to move my big pools. So the last option would be uh, one of the most flexible, which is ZFS. Uh, encryption at the data set level. The downside here is that um, because you're encrypting at the file system level, you're leaking a bit more metadata, but you can get stronger authentication and turn of the data. Um, yeah, And you have to import the pool first. You can accidentally forget to that, oh yes, my uh, Slash VARDB is encrypted, but my VAR lock isn't. Oops. Hmm. I locked the uh, important data. So here be dragons. So, um, so the then there are some, the... or at least there have been some performance pitfalls with uh, OpenZFS encryption. And yeah, but those are implementation issues which aren't fundamental to the trade off. But it's the Virtually more complex than just decrypting the drives once at boot and afterward it's transparent. As far as the ZFS data set uh, metadata uh, leaking comment that you made, would that be like in the sense that they'd be able to see that my data set is, you know, tank slash evidence underscore of underscore so, fraud? Like, <laughs> the, or, or, so or, what's not encrypted is. Uh, the, the structure of your data, like they can see how much of your data has changed when by just looking at the transaction numbers in the transaction. They don't know see file names other than the paths to mount points. So they don't know which file in the file system changed, but a file in this file system changed. Um, they can guesstimate the path length of files, just is it is it a short or long path, basically? Um, which directory the file contains? The structure is kind of has to. I don't know about the directory contents, but um, so the problem is an attacker who gets to look multiple times at your encrypted drives. Let's say you use it with iSCSI over a SAN or your hoster is your attacker and you're using their Um Then they learn a bit more with ZFS um, over time. Hmm. Not enough to truly reveal plain text. Cool. I... Depending on how esoteric your uh, attack scenario is, that may or may not matter. So and how I, would you how would you tier these in terms of like performance overhead from like worse? The advantage to... of doing the encryption at the ZFS level is that if you have a mirrored uh, pool or parity pool, you don't have to encrypt the data uh, multiple times. Whereas if you do it at the disk level, you have to do it once per disk. And if you have a let's take a pathological but realistic example, you have a three-way mirrored pool. Uh, all writes have to be encrypted three times. Unless you do a scrub, reads don't suffer. Hmm. Reads suffer because they have to read in all copies. If to validate uh, doing scrubbing, but doing normal reads, you read only one copy unless that is a uh, checksum error. So. Um, the advantage is potentially that yeah, the this level or partition level encryption can be a bit dumber, which has the advantage and the disadvantage. So there is no uh, perfect answer for everyone. It's the usual. It depends. A big advantage of ZFS uh, encryption is that you can replicate uh, the data sets to a system which does not have the key. 
So potentially you can have the key loaded on your production server and the backup server does not get to learn the key. That's a lot harder to do um, with block level encryption. <laughs> and you would have to basically export the block storage via something like iSCSI to the machine, uh, import an encrypted pool there and replicate to it, which is um, not optimal. Whereas otherwise you can just CFS send to a system which does not know the key. Which is tempting. So I threw in some points in the doc and uh, let's see, one thing to not miss is there are certain trusted computing group TCG levels of self encrypting drives that are very much symbolic. It's a password and unencrypted data. So be very cautious about what level that is. And the higher the meaningful level, the more difficult it is to get drives or replacement drives. But from a performance perspective to that question, I believe in theory it should be completely transparent to the user. So it's all hardware ASIC based encryption. Yep. But Go ahead. on the other end, if you take something like the Apple M uh, storage controllers, yep. uh, the OS drives basically are always hardware encrypted with supposedly good encryption, the keys are in the secure enclave, and if you decrypt them, they just store the current encryption key uh, in the secure enclave so that it can auto-read that. And the advantage of doing it like that, and where I suspect some of the other SSD vendors may have done the same, is that um, it also eliminates all uh, long runs of ones and zeros, which are problem for um, clock and error recovery hmm. because after encryption your if your encryption is true encryption the data is just random bits with no pathological patterns over a certain length to be expected within the lifetime of a solar system right so just well. encrypting the data as a kind of whitening so uh, you can then um, to be fair write them to flash if uh, if there is a file system that will you know be with us after we leave the solar system it's probably going to be zfs amen <laughs> sadly i'm certain that the boot code will still be on a fat 32. <laughs> 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 One quick point I'll also throw out is that I sure like bootable systems and I try not to have anything too uh, sensitive there. I suppose there would be SSH keys and all that, but um, I then like just the, I, the notion of importing a pool and then decrypting as opposed to, oh, I have no idea if this pool is importable and it happens to be encrypted. And uh, let me just throw out that really be aware of when you have encryption enabled and have backups of your keys because i really don't like those phone calls when people say hey so i set up encryption and then i like reinstalled the os of choice and that disposed of everything especially in say true nose and yeah there i said it yeah that's a call where you can just say okay where is your tape oh it wasn't important enough to back up to tape yes it isn't important enough to recover well, and the answer is what's well, tape grandpa and uh just one little point there uh certain vendors love to ship systems with windows bitlocker enabled not telling the yes, user not story. prompting them to back up their keys or print them and they do have a nifty way to like make a printout that's handy etc but uh some bios updates will blow out the keys and bad things happen with zero recourse and there that's also a yep. phone call i really don't it's like it's just going to that's just a ticking time bomb that should be illegal by the way but anyway um uh, didn't you pay for the one drive <laughs> they'll give you Sorry. some for free but it's like it, oh, is, it is a it is a bit interesting that you know lemon laws exist for uh, vendors not to sell you automobiles that don't work right um except apparently for electric trucks but anyway um, and cars not, not so much so going for, off and all, but yeah. yeah commodity you know or uh, enterprise hardware you know where 
arguably you could be ruining a lot of people's days uh, to, I don't know. That's and they do. And I don't think we hear about the worst cases in, well, in, we do hear about you know, ransomware in, say, universities and hospitals and maybe, uh, we today should, on PBS. Go ahead, Jan. Maybe you should write a crawler to uh, search all court uh, records for, uh, in bankruptcy cases for disk encryption. A bit locker. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, to you, learn about uh, examples. Uh, and a fun one are the accountants whose nephew set up, say, a free NAS system long ago, and it starts failing drives because they vanished. And then they do, say, well, they have to go to book, college. Bookkeeping. They have to go to college, exactly. <laughs> and then the bookkeeper is suddenly un, in, separated from, say, the data. And then people have, say, quarterly filings that are due by a certain date, and they have daily penalties if those uh, filings are not filed. Mm -hmm. And then many sad faces all around. So there's that. But uh, joking aside, when it comes to encryption, before you can make any useful deployment decision, uh, you have to come up with a threat model what you want to defend against. Yeah. Do you want to tick a checkbox? Do you want to be able to uh, make use of vendor warranty replacement? Uh, or do you have to follow such process so that your insurance will pay mm -hmm. uh, if something goes wrong? Or uh, are you on the run from several governments? Because each call for very different deployments, and especially the last one, very different trade offs. Because if you, for example, uh, no longer welcome in a country, it may be better that the data is destroyed than that it is always recoverable. Yeah. Sometimes losing data is the lesser evil than um, being caught with the data. Mm -hmm. uh, let's shelve that one for maybe either a larger group or a dedicated conversation because, yes, over, fortunately in the history of the doc, there are some things about threat models, but that's a can of worms that uh, maybe is not best before a holiday, but extremely important there. And, so yeah, anything else related to encryption at this time? I hope that's helpful, Santi, and sets yeah, this is direction. awesome. There yeah, have been some exactly what I was hoping for. It's like a kind cool. Of a... Um, there were some obs somewhat obscure, but not entirely non-existent issues related to open ZFS encryption, such that a key change would perhaps be problematic. And then one issue that could only be reproduced on spark as i recall so yeah it's a fascinating one and uh it is unfortunate that the company that produced the native encryption was bought and i believe all the original developers vanished with probably a big old compensation in their pockets and thought okay th we'll leave this to uh people like what's what's the name greg jan santi steve and myself so there's that but um When it comes to encryption and ZFS, both the FreeBSD block encryption uh, and others can read raw key bits from a pipe. Mm. So uh, one thing you can do if you don't have enough key slots and so on is to use something like GPG decrypt some key file, and then you can have as many people able to encrypt, decrypt their copy of the key material just stored on the machine encrypted with their key. So you can build quite uh, advanced systems. You could even go as far as requiring some kind of threshold, but so that three out of five uh, sysadmin have to be woken up with uh, right. system reboots. But at some point, it's just uh, it's a lot more likely you're going to uh, shoot your foot up off than that an attacker actually uh, materializes and bounces of your uh, yep. encryption. Yep. And coming to all of the encryption uh, technologies we just mentioned is that um, 
their data at rest encryption. So as long as your server is uh, running and the pool is accessible, Correct. Um, yeah. the key is somewhere in the computer. Yeah. And especially if you're doing it at the block level, if you have, a, let's say, a local privilege escalation, encryption doesn't matter at that point because this kernel knows the key and will happily use it for any user. That's a good point. Uh, who wanted to know about YubiKey support? Yeah, uh, so that's my question. And as I look at this, YubiKey 5 NFC key, I would love to know if there's some so, short path to using OpenZFS and YubiKey. Uh, or basically, when uh, anything which takes a YubiKey on one end and emits the same secret key material every time works. Okay. So uh, at least the old uh, USB uh, UB keys can be configured to, uh, for example, on a long press, always emit a stored password. Basically just type in a password. I see, cool. Um, wow. That's at least, um, it's basically one password hardware key manager. Yeah, as a password manager, sorry. Okay, and related question. I had two bank calculators get wet or bricked, and suddenly I was separated from my banking, and my bank said, just drop into our office 10,000 miles away. Uh, do YubiKeys have any notion of backup slash duplication, or if they're one key and if it gets Let's see, um, you, microwave or whatever too many times well have a nice day you are now separated from your thing. well that depends on if you generate the key material first of all if it's just a stored password you can set a second second yubi key to the same password okay if you know what you're doing at the command yeah. line and i assume other vendors as well but if you use public key cryptography and generate the private key with a do not export flag on the smart card, then yes, that applies and you have to have a way to accept multiple private keys. The other things like GPG decryption and sign the message containing only the master key to all of these uh, corresponding public keys. And then any of the five Yubi keys can be encrypted. Works. Yep. Okay. Uh, while my search for Yubi key and ZFS encryption did not give me anything specific, this was actually a nifty overview article I dropped in chat. Um, if you open the ZFS load key uh, man page, yeah, will that mention uh, Yubi key? No, it won't. But it will. Um, Tell you that there's a key location property. Ah, correct. And uh, so, um, and you can give it as a prompt by just piping it in. Yep. Okay. So basically, you can read the key from standard in. Yep. Anyway, um, I found the native encryption remarkably frustrating at first insofar as when you're doing say a zfs send if it if the send fails you might not have any indication whatsoever of why it failed be it an unloaded key be it just property mismatch be it not raw be it all sorts of fun things so if you if any of you come up with uh really proven smooth strategies i would love to hear more Anyway. You have to make sure that the receiving system has ZFS native encryption support because yep. otherwise it will oh, choke on the replication stream because it contains basically object types it doesn't know about. Uh -huh. Okay. And yeah. Oh, yeah. be sure to make, decide if you want to send the data encrypted or unencrypted. Correct. And I personally would love a big old armored safe with an unencrypted backup as opposed to trusting the magic of like a YubiKey and it aging away, blah, 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 blah. blah. So let's uh, uh, leave it at that. And I would love to hear- You need to process to periodically about. validate that you exact can restore. bingo. Which almost in ZFS terms is an online system that's 
air gapped and you simply say, okay, I'm booting it, I'm checking it, I'm doing a scrub um, and checking the health of the disks. And well, at least I have some level of confidence and dump it to tape mm -hmm. unencrypted or encrypted and have a nice day. Anyway, so uh, let's see, was it Greg who had some interest in the SNMP? Yeah, a few listed. Quick question to everyone present. Is anyone using SNMP for anything ever? Yes. You I are. use it a lot. You use it a lot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I had never used SNMP in any way, shape, or form Friday. And by Monday, I had uh, 17 or so brutal pages of what I learned. Now, what I've documented is specific to FreeBSD's own native implementation, but there are a whole lot of universals here. Uh, there is a nifty recent book from Michael W. Lucas on SNMP, which is great, but it only has a few pages that say very little about BSNMP, which I, I can't blame him. And I found an article from him from long ago. Those are all linked here. But this was sort of a, a uh mystery to solve on like where did the thing come from and maybe it lives in someone's home directory as upstream and there's a port that makes the ucd which i learned is uc davis uh standard oids available so i'm waiting on the uh developer of that maintainer of that to let me know if that's indeed a bug i found or not i sent that on the first he was very responsive on saturday uh, so, yeah, uh, it is very difficult to avoid getting immediately into the weeds here. But here's a whole bunch of reading material on that from the man page and otherwise, and where to find SNMP Mastery by Michael W. Lucas from 2020. So it's relatively fresh. Um, there have been projects to improve the in base one. And no, I'm not sure if at this very moment it has V3 support, but it took all this documenting to actually come up with questions because I, I didn't have any clue how any of this works. So, um uh i of course was intimidated by the 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 oid syntax which uh little later i learned means a whole bunch of stuff when you have like a one a three a six and a one and a four and a one and a one and a one and a one and a zero for an index and blah 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 so uh under the hood it seems to do all this numeric stuff at the human level, it does things like, oh, that prefix with 2021, which really stands out, is UC Davis, also known as UCD, um, also known as a bunch of things. But I think there is a bug at the very bottom of this described uh, in the FreeBSD UCD port going back and forth with the translate. So uh, all news to me, you get the thing going, you start dumping out information, and you get all this lovely repetitive what turns out to be tree-based data that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And you get a whole lot of, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven with like nothing associated with that. So for we newbies, that's kind of uh, brutal. So, you know. uh, and just one to, of the... here's some of that mapping. So it goes from like words to numbers. And if that mapping's broken, there's another sad face. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, one of the things where newcomers to anything OID based tend yeah. to stumble, be it LDAP or um, this case, SNMP, um, is that, oh no, I have to register to get my own prefix. Right, 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 right. And I just uh, posted a link to the documentation oh. of the prefix uh, 2.25. And after that, you can just use UUIDs. So oh, pick a UUID. Okay. Format it as a giant decimal number, and then you are um, compliant and get to uh, use anything starting with 2.25 dot your giant number representing your truly correctly paid UUID. Yes. And then um, after that, you can have your own structure. Okay. I'm tempted to say going from OIDs to UUIDs is either out of the pan it's an embedding of the 128-bit UUID namespace into the OID namespace. Okay. And that effectively creates a decentralized uh, place where anyone 
who can run GUID again uh, and then convert from hex to decimal gets to generate a, a standards compliant um, OID without okay. having to register with anyone. Okay. So you don't need a DUNS number for your organization or something to uh, well, register. For free, but okay. Um, can you? I'd hope you can use shorthand rather than supplanting all. You assign a name to it once. Oh, great. Uh, awesome. In your schema, and then you reference the schema. Okay, that said, I'll throw in a few more things. Um, the BSNMP, the um, Berk. Bergmot, whatever, it's a, a hippo in some languages. Uh, they have the MIB standard and the add on, uh, ba -ba -ba. oh, sorry, Benchmot, there it is. Uh, and then the add on UCD, which seem to be pretty standard profiles that'll be seen by other systems and I'm sure is in net SNMP. But key point, it has some native FreeBSD isms such as HAS, which is high availability uh, storage, a bit like. Uh, well, the Linux, they have an office in Oregon or used to. Uh, DRBD, replicating block device. Hope I got that acronym right. And then there's packet filter and uh, other topics. So it, you can uh, quickly spit out thousands upon thousands of OIDs with like the default configuration. And you can, it only has the MIB2 by default. You can add all of these and some have dependencies and you can add the port, port base UCD one with that. So that said, you can start it and simply do the walk. I do like how the FreeBSD tool checks local host without a whole bunch of flags and, and level, et cetera, and uh, protocol level, blah, blah, blah. So by default, you get like, oh, 6,882 answers, which to a new user is terrifying. Um, the error handling is okay. If you have a typo, it probably won't start and you might get answers like this, like, oh no, in messages, hey, sorry, this, this error. Oh, it has a line number, that's helpful. So this is the standard syntax for net SNMP, SNMP walk, whereas on FreeBSD, you can just type BSNMP. I'm like, oh, I like not trying to remember if it's like, VC public, blah, 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 blah. But yes, there's a place for that and the security and, and, and. Um, these are also in ports I didn't look too close. mBrowse is handy. It's on, I'm sure Linux, possibly even Windows and Friends and Mac, but it's a simple OID and MIB browser and you can just see the big tree graphically, which is helpful for some. Uh, I've been putting questions in here because I'm, I, I kind of, learned everything I could till I hit various brick walls. And so uh, getting to the point, uh, I know Antronik has some ideas for maybe jail OIDs, which simply say what's running and CPU usage and a few little things that are jail specific. Uh, there's a topic of ZFS one. So I found this article on, uh, let's see, to get to bring it fully on topic. Uh, this is the BSNMP, you know, I'll, I'll leave the cookies, syntax. So I think this is only to BSNMP, whereas on net SNMP, it's extend and a bunch of flags and such. And so somebody is like, hey, we could run through a bunch of syscontrols looking, I believe, for ZFS ones and just bar from right out. Oh, here's going with the UCD extend syntax, blah, blah, blah. So they do things like stats, work concept. And uh, Greg, if it's not obvious, I'm about to just hit you with a bunch of questions because like this was me just st sticking my toe in the water and quickly documenting everything I could. Like security, yeah, um, there's, there is some notion and I've not learned about it yet. Um, there are a few good articles on monitoring with Prometheus, and I know Rod is interested in getting all his systems to just give like long-term network performance topics, which relates to all those ZFS send performance topics and other jail and beehive topics, you name it. But here's that bug where I'm like, uh-oh, the mapping, I don't think is working. It works in SNMP walk, which has its own copy of the UCD data and then all that. So, uh, Probably, uh out of sync uh, schema definitions between the two. Uh, 
So that's actually pictures. a good point. I could copy the SNMP one in, which I, no, I didn't grab their exact one. So there's that. So that said, I would love to know, Greg, how you are using it. And if you're doing anything fancy like custom traps, which now there's a terrible example, but I'd love to know what it looks like to simply have for the management aspect, a simple reboot, which is maybe a terrible, again, terrible example, but what are the mechanics of saying, hey, I send this like secured message to a system and it kicks off a reboot? Begin so, replication. Pardon? Oh, oh, or replicate. I, I like that. Uh, oh, I like that a lot. List That's your good. snapshots. List uh, your data sets. And open VFS. Uh, kick off. Uh, one thing about listing. Wow, it's it does have some notion of tables, but it's really, in my observation, single value oriented as opposed to a really nifty structured output, but I'm happy to be completely wrong about that. Uh, snapshot. So, Greg, do you have any insights, particularly regarding to regarding ZFS? Yeah, so, so I'll uh, preface, I'm not, I'm not a, a simple network uh, management protocol expert. Oh, you uh, know more any... than I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I'm, I've been using it all my life, but uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, 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 that's just the way we monitored things from day one. So, um, like our power bars, I, I use it to make sure they're balanced uh, nice. between between phases. Uh, we monitor the uh, and graph the temperature and humidity and other environmental stuff in our uh, data center. Nice. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, if a machine reboots or whatever, uh, we'll get a trap on that. Um, and for for uh, my ZFS servers, we had to uh, extend it. We basically wrote a script. Uh, I think you actually touched on it up there, um, because uh, uh, there I couldn't find a way to monitor like my L2 arc uh, usage and whatnot. Cool. Um, with a default thing, so you had to write something up to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, using that to monitor my Zill and memory usage and, and whatnot. Um, overall, uh, we use it uh, basically to monitor the environmental conditions in all the servers in the uh, in the computer room. Mm -hmm. Most most all of our servers have like some sort of baseboard management mm -hmm. uh, layer, like iDRAC or. Sure, sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, if the server reboots, we'll get a message right away on that. Um, if there's a voltage uh, spike or a brownout, um, it will also catch those. Um, you can you can pretty much make it do whatever. Uh, some some machines now will send us or send a trap if the disk goes over eighty uh, percent um, as a uh, proactive alert. Eighty percent, which regard, as in a pool at eighty percent, or SSD eighty percent remaining, or which eighty percent? The file file system in our case. So Got it. I have Got it. Yeah, I haven't specifically. Now you can definitely extend SMT. You can write as many scripts as you want, um, mm -hmm. and then hook and hook it in, and it'll send traps when events that you find interesting happen. Um, so, but I haven't done that with the data pool or anything. Uh, in relation to that, um, I was just I was been more interested in to see how my uh, L two arc uh, is performing. Sure, totally. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And that's uh, I'll I'll get to my true motivation when the time comes soon. But um, are you using? Well, obviously, I assume pure Net SNMP. But then, do you have any nifty tools like Grafana and Prometheus? And okay, uh, so that's. Yes and no. <laughs> so okay. right now I'm using uh, Libra NMS. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, which uh, is kind of you just point all your stuff to it, and it will make pretty grass. Um, you can make rules. Uh, you know, if if these two temperature um, devices in the server room, if both of them hit over this, then send a a trap and also send an SMS message and a few other. So you can make rules with actions on it, um, depending on what you want. Um, sure. Like for like for the disk full thing, we uh, wrote um, a hook in the Teams, which will send a Teams message to the group. 
Okay, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to get a little proactive on things. So Heck yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So so a whole bunch of things like that are possibly done now. Uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Um, we have two things right now that are being graphed. Uh, so we have a license server, and um, we have a couple hundred artists. But some of these licenses that we get um, are very expensive, and um, we monitor the usage of of the licenses. So we we know when we have to buy more. So we're not like oh, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just a bit of a predictive thing. Um, also, too, it will show us at any given time how many licenses are checked out and if we want to drill down on it we can and that's one of the nice things that um, uh, Prometheus will allow you to do um, you can get granular on things so uh, anyways I, I we had an intern in here and uh, I won't I won't get into the backstory but I, I I was hired here at a startup company and the previous system administrator um, was like a very bad business choice um, to hire him. And, and he did a lot of things really without forward thinking. So for the last year, I've been basically restructuring the entire environment and whatnot. So I have to prioritize things. And this stuff is of high geek value to me, but um, I, I basically delegated the Prometheus uh, set up to one of our interns that we hired from one of the local schools for the summer. Nice. Um, long story short, it, it's my intention to stop using Libra and MS at some point, except for um, in some niche case, I don't know what it may be, and and go totally with uh, Prometheus and Grafana, because uh, the way they handle their roles and whatnot, um, it, it, it's a lot better than uh, Libra and MS, like with the back off timers and whatnot. So you can say um, it's easy to make a rule in Prometheus if the temperature stays over this for this long, then do this. Um, nice. Yeah. Whereas with uh, Libra and MS, it's just, it runs a check every five minutes or whatever. And you have to base your decisions on that. <laughs> Leave it to time. the meter. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I for, uh, okay. So uh, uh, I'm brain dumping here, your brain dump, because I did not see things like the license server playing into it, but totally it's like, that's a metric, and I guess I'll give my use case. Yeah. This my interest was directly from the second to last jail call, production user call, where uh, various people help diagnose a network problem. Okay, well, often it's like okay, so really also a bad example. What's the MTU on the system you're like trying to send to, etc. Now. Uh, there are a whole bunch of network knobs to turn. Yep, endless, great. Um, they're often kernel related, okay. But one experience that scarred me was working with a client who was debugging a high speed like interface, I think 40 gig for a very long time, and it worked flawlessly except for about half the speed. Well, it was an X8, eight lane PCI card plugged into an X4 slot. And Whoops. Oops, and I learned where to go dig down and find that information. But having that information like within easy reach, and yes, I suppose there are security implications of knowing what uh, slot performance is available to a device. But at the same time, I'd rather it just be you know, published on the outside of the building and save hundreds of dollars in diagnostics and hours of time, or if not days. So. Uh, my increased thinking, especially in closed environments, is like, okay, just get everything out there that might matter because uh, you will hopefully know what to rule out really quickly and don't waste your time on it. So that's, uh, yeah, LVC, exactly. The key point is the C allows you to see the current and supported interface, PCI, lane speed, whatever proper way there is to say that. So. There's my last weekend experiment with SNMP, specifically BSNMP, but uh, it, I've heard many quotations, everyone uses net SNMP, but having some previously native hooks are helpful. And I must wonder if there's an opportunity for just a, 
a portable one to things like, I don't know, OSs that are not Linux. <laughs> I don't know if Illumos has its own SNMP handling in any way, shape, or form, but hey, it was a, a great exercise. Yeah, when, when, when I first seen the B, I was hoping that it meant stood for block, because I was, I've been waiting for a, a nice way to monitor uh, ZFS, all the, uh, you know, various parts of it, um, which still doesn't seem to uh, exist. Uh, well, I, it kind of is up to people like you, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to make, to make that, and that's what I've been doing, right? So it's been, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have things you can share? Yeah, everything I got, I, I found on the internet. So, um, right. can you drop links into any of this or prepare them for next time? Because this is this problem, I don't think is going to go over, go away overnight. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> once I stop talking, I'm listening more. I'll turn to the web page if I start searching while I'm talking. Awesome. Uh, things go off the rails. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. I, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one quick uh, project that I've been working on, and Please. and um, I've done this at a few other places and i've mm -hmm. never never gotten to the point to test it or implement it because it's, it's scary as hell so um bring it on we, yeah um so we have ups's here so mm -hmm. if the power goes out um you know we can survive a short power outage or, or a brown out or uh, you know any harmonics issues and whatnot so i i've had this script so anyway the, the, the ups goes on to battery power and it will oh. have 15 minutes left and i've written things that will monitor it because uh, it'll keep sending traps saying i got five minutes left i got three minutes left so i wrote this script that will send out a uh, message to all the servers and storage servers and everything and shut them down when it gets down to uh, like three minutes mm -hmm. um and that's what i'm working on uh, when during my lunches, when I'm eating lunch or whatever, I'll poke nice. at it. Okay, I, yeah. okay. So I still haven't finished it yet, but um, it, it has to be one of the scariest things to turn on in production because you, you don't want it to mess up, right? It's uh, correct. Yeah, I hope this gets interpreted correctly, and I know what I'm doing. So um, anyway, it's uh, if if I do shut off all the machines in production, I uh, you guys won't know about it, but. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah. and of course, you don't want to like fully oh, automated okay. resume Before generation. Go ahead, Jan. Fully automated resume generation. <laughs> oh, brutal. Okay. Uh, I will add that. Fully automated. Yeah. Fastest, fastest way to get promoted to customer as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a career limit in uh, project potentially. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that said, um, one, I'm glad I've sort of struck a nerve here. Two, uh, I, we, we've probably all had these thoughts in various ways, and as I was throwing in there, like you don't want the JBOD to say, oh, I'm, I'm turning off in the controlling server and the related daemons and the iSCSI attached system to like go off later. No, you need to get that sequence really, really right. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Oh, I like that. So yet, yeah, um, you are welcome to drop links directly in the doc without formatting, just far from sure. in there, and I'll make sense of them because I'm finding gems at every turn. And sure. people, uh, I, I do prefer blog posts in English, but some of the most valuable ones were in like Japanese and Czech and other languages, which is fine because modern translation is reasonably good and the syntax is all universal. So there's that. Um, uh, the whole notion of monitoring OpenZFS is potentially a, a theme, a track, a session, a brainstorming, whatever for the uh, user summit. Um, so uh, I will put that right here. Question. ZFS session slash theme at the summit. Because we all, I mean, duplication of effort is not helpful there. And dare I say, just like all these, oh, pool compatibility, compatibility levels, which are requiring people to track them and all that, it might even be 
way hypothetically, wow, what if the project put out and maintained a OpenZFS specific MIB OID pair or whatever uh, that just tracks the current version. So what we don't want to see is, oh, someone did all this work back on V28 and it's like, yeah, it's not taking advantage of any modern features. So, oh boy. Oh yeah. Someone got carried away and uh, to find an OID for each ZFS property. I wouldn't put it past them. And some like that example, they're just looping through and saying, okay, bang, 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 bang. Project maintain open ZFS OID. Uh, am I, and I'm even just learning the language here. Okay, anything else on that broad topic? That uh, is, uh, that was nice and focused. I appreciate that. And I, I, the, the encryption will, is, will always come up as a perennial topic. Um, and now this monitoring, which again, Friday, I, I wouldn't, know where to start on the notion of ZFS and SNMP, but now I have at least enough information to be dangerous. And I was about Greg, to say, yeah, enough enough information to get in trouble. Yeah. Yes, correct. <laughs> and and so I personally don't know what's exactly next, but I do I do know I need some questions answered on like where's upstream of this specific thing. And then uh I tried pasting that doc, but it didn't let me oh, I probably have to download it up. Is it okay to, Greg to share that in the doc? Sure, yes, for sure. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Let me put it somewhere. Um, download. That's, that's uh, the output of the script that I mentioned. Um, that's what that will provide. Nice. Oh, there it went. Uh, it did make it eventually. It's very slow. Uh, cool. Um, it is a challenge insofar as it's really tiny, so I'll leave it to the user to zoom in or download. But uh, what have you found most useful or surprising um well actually nothing okay, <laughs> um, cool. yeah it is so far uh i i i've i've mentioned this before in other ones mm -hmm. so this machine here gets backed up over nfs and it keeps in a date and everything um yep. yeah so we, we've been talked about that in various ways to get around that so, so yeah like every couple of days all those graphs kind of become not really uh, representative of reality. Okay. Um, anything else? If not, I say we call it good and uh, I will digest what you've provided here. And uh, I absolutely look forward to other links. Just, just, I assume there's some repos out there of better yep. DFS. Hopefully. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll post those into your Google document cool. under, underneath those graphs, perhaps. Just pop it right in there. Thank you yep. so, so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, well, those in uh, the land of the free, enjoy your fourth. We probably will have a beehive call tomorrow because, well, most attendees are outside the fourth, and I'm, I'm probably just working away uh, until evening. So thank you. Have a great one. Happy U.S. Day. Yeah, it's it's going to be great. We, uh, I'm assuming. Actually, this came up in conversation today. Uh, right. For those of you in the, uh, uh, you know, colder part of America, um, is there is do you guys celebrate uh, the Battle of 1812, like burning down the White House? Is there is there? A holiday <laughs> <for that? laughs> I was uh, mentioning this to some of my more patriotic coworkers that uh, hey, strictly speaking, we are uh, zero one on that. One. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> we're, we're the only country that ever. Uh, that ever uh, won a war against these states, but uh, no, no, well, that's, that's not, not true. It won a war against itself, so that's true. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we 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 don't celebrate that. We're about to spend millions of dollars renaming streets in Toronto because uh, they're called Dundas Street, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little little crazy. But anyway, um, hey, you know, public yeah. works projects. They're, uh, yeah, they put money in uh, working class pockets. Yours. Yeah, fair no, enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you, everyone. Have a great one. Yep, you take care. Okay. Bye.